My name is Nella Eitvlucht. I am the Executive Director of Friendship Ministries. This is an organization whose mission is to share God's love with people who have intellectual disabilities, enabling them to be active members of God's family. My passion is helping churches minister beside adults with intellectual disabilities. I use the word beside instead of to so that it, we are more inclusive, that we are not thinking of ministry as something that you do for or to the person, but with them. Friendship has been ministering beside adults with intellectual disabilities for 30 years, and it is our hope that this video will provide you with practical, hands-on tips and tools to help you do the same in your individual churches. Friendship programs are Bible study programs that promote positive relationships between mentors and friends, and they help adults with intellectual disabilities easily transition into the Sunday morning worship service. These programs can meet on Sunday morning before or after worship. They can meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, any day of the week that you choose and works out with their schedule. These programs are meant to be a mutual Bible study for mentor and friend. So, why should you minister beside adults with intellectual disabilities? God calls us to minister beside them in His Word. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18 and 27, it reads, In fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. But our society and our churches deal with numerous barriers to inclusive ministry. One of them is the physical barriers, and most of us know what many of those are. They might be the lack of an elevator to get up the stairs into the sanctuary, or it might be a sanctuary that does not have pew cutouts so that someone in a wheelchair can sit alongside their family. Or a barrier might be that you can't get on the pulpit to participate in baptism or you, your church may overlook the fact that you need help being served communion. There's also a difference between a person who walks into church and needs a very short distance from the handicapped parking into the sanctuary, or the person in a wheelchair who simply can't get in the building. The barriers of attitude are probably the most difficult to overcome. This is the attitude that congregants have towards people with disabilities and thinking that the person does not have value or they have fear that they don't know how to say the right thing to the person with disability. This barrier of attitude takes a long time for people to become comfortable, but mostly it's through ignorance or fear that it comes about, not because people are intentionally trying to be exclusionary. I often think of the barrier of attitude as one in which we need to think alongside the person with disability. What, it would, what would it be like to be like that person, to live their life? And getting to know them will be the best thing for us to get over our attitudes of discrimination towards these people. Another barrier could be sensory or communication. When a person has sensory issues such as a hearing that is very sensitive to loud noises or they have difficulty communication, there's barriers to them participating in the worship service or in Bible studies at church. Another barrier is the, a barrier of omission. This is where we neglect the person with a disability or their family. We forget that they need to be included or that they need our church to follow alongside them. The barrier against giving is not using the giftedness of that person with disability. We often think of them as not having something to offer back to the congregation. But if we look hard, we will learn that that person does have giftedness. Might be the gift of prayer. Might be the gift of understanding how you feel about something else. So we need to look at them as individuals who have something to offer to the body of Christ. Next, how do we incorporate inclusive ministry into our congregations? Well, there's a variety of ways in which different denominations and our churches minister beside people with intellectual disabilities. But this is what Friendship Ministry believes and how we do it. We have several core values. The first one is that everyone is created in God's image and deserves love and justice, both in our society and in our churches. Redemption is the second one, that this redemption is a gift from God. It is not dependent on a certain level of intelligence. Very often, people with intellectual disabilities are told, 
you don't know enough. Therefore, you cannot be confirmed. You cannot make profession of faith, depending on what your denomination calls full church membership. We need to have churches understand that intelligence is not the basis of a faith, that faith is a gift from God in His grace. And lastly, we believe that the church is complete only when it includes all of God's children, when all people are seen as equals in God's eyes and in our own eyes. Sometimes I say to churches, if you have welcome everyone sign on your church part, uh, lawn, but you don't include people with disabilities, maybe you should think about what that sign really is saying. For those people who drive past your congregation and do not feel welcome because their child makes too much noise in Sunday school, or their son or daughter has an intellectual disability that makes it difficult for them to attend worship on their own and they, you have not offered help, for these families, you need to think about what it means to welcome as Jesus welcomed. So these values infuse all areas of our teaching. Friendship's model has worked well for 30 years across 75 different denominations, both Catholic and Protestant, and in 28 different countries. And here are some steps that you can take to begin a ministry like friendship. First, find partners within your congregation who will walk with you. It's a core group of people with the same vision for ministering beside people with intellectual disabilities. You need to include your pastor and your church board. Get their support. They may not be the people who actually set up the structure of your program, but they certainly need to support the idea that all God's people includes people with disabilities. So in a friendship class, the structure of your program would begin with welcome. This is an important time to share what's happened over the past week. We recommend putting on name tags. This reminds each person that they are important. Friends are often nameless and faceless to society, so in friendship, we want them to feel important. Worship. This is a big component of a friendship program. By singing praise songs that are easily learned, friends learn what it means to worship. Songs may apply to the current Bible study. They may also be songs that are frequently sung in your worship service. Prayer can be done in numerous ways. Some groups take requests as friends enter the room. Other groups take requests and place them on a prayer board. Friends should learn that their prayers belong to themselves, those asking the prayer requests, rather than belonging to a global prayer. Friends should also learn that their prayers are heard by God and others. Here's an example of a prayer request. Crystal, who's a friend of mine, gave her testimony in church one Sunday when we had the friendship service. This is a service where my friends and mentors together lead the worship service. And we had Crystal give her testimony about her prayer request in Friendship Program. Crystal told how she had cancer and how because of her disability was not able to use chemotherapy. So the only option was to have surgery. Crystal had asked us in Friendship to pray for her. And so for several weeks, we prayed and prayed for Crystal. The amazing thing is that even though Crystal was not able to have chemotherapy. Crystal is now cancer free. We had prayed for healing and she thoroughly believes, as I do, that God heard her prayer. Crystal is a woman of faith and she taught us that even in a time of adversity, her prayer request that we all participated in was very important to her, to all the friends and mentors, and to God. After singing in prayer time, very often, the friendship programs will then move to the group Bible study. This is where the Bible lesson is shared through a narrated drama and or with pictures. Members of each program participate in acting out parts of the story. The mentors and friends frequently share their acting role. This method of studying works well if a friend can't read. The mentor can read the Bible passage or the narration of the drama and guide the friend to be the actor. It is often helpful to run through with a small rehearsal before doing the final drama. This enables everyone to participate much more fully. After the Bible lesson, the one-to-one -one review time is a time for building the relationship between the mentor and the friend. This one-to-one -one time is so important. It's a time that allows for the groups to review the Bible story, pray together, 
and very importantly, learn about each other. This is a time when you can find out what colors do your friends like? What do they like to do in their spare time? Where do they work? They may want to also participate with you in an activity that reinforces the concept of the Bible session. This is so important. That means that during a friendship program, the lesson has gone over two and three times to reinforce the learning. Fellowship is an important time that further develops the relationships, and this often happens over cookies, punch, or other treats. Again, it's a time for mentor and friend to be together in a very informal setting, but it allows mentors to learn to know each other and friends to know the other friends and mentors. A lot of the fellowship that happens in a friendship program is very much a building of the body of Christ. There are other ways to build the relationship. If you as a mentor are really committed to developing this relationship, it means that you need to do things in a very specific way. Mentors and friends grow in their relationship to God, but mentors worldwide exclaim that they learn so much in friendship and receive much more than they ever give. It is helpful for mentors to visit their friends at their home and workplace. This will give them a much broader understanding of who their friend really is, what he or she can do and likes. Oftentimes the mentors will tell me, I didn't know my friend could do this. I didn't know he liked that. And that is why knowing the broader context of their life really will help you develop a relationship. Some mentor and friends will have dinner together. Some of them will go out for coffee. This is an important aspect to building the friend. Many of these friends do not have people from the community that will help them develop a relationship. I have heard from group home staff that the friendship mentors are the only people from the community that ever pay attention to their friend. Keep in mind that some of these friends do not have family. They could be wards of the state or province. They could be people who have not had a relationship with a parent for many, many years. You, the mentor, can be that friend to this person. But think in terms also of the evangelism opportunities that you have. These friends who live in group homes have staff who may or may not be Christians. You have an opportunity to share God's love to them. Their families may have been hurt by church rejecting them in the years past. The way you as a mentor extend yourself to these families is going to be very important in sharing God's love to the broader community. And that is an evangelism component of friendship ministries that many people do not think of immediately. We also have a link that is on our website called What Friendship Mentors Need to Know. And this will provide you more things on how can you help your friend develop a relationship with you, with their God, and especially how to use some of the friendship materials. Friendship Ministries enables that person with intellectual disabilities to learn about worship in a safe and accepting situation. This allows for a more successful transition into the worship service on Sunday. In friendship, they learn the culture of church and its rituals. And this culture and ritual may include how to dress, when to stand up, when to sit down, what is prayer, what do we sing in church, who is the minister? And this is all similar to how we as children learn the Bible stories in Sunday school or religious education. So some practical methods for inclusion of those with intellectual disabilities would be, and these are concrete learners so that you need to keep that in mind. One, use repetitive liturgies. Here's an example of some of those short repetitive things that we used to say in church and some churches no longer do. But we might say short things like, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. My friend Marilyn that sits with me in worship cannot read, but she is very good at the next one when the pastor says, this is the word of the Lord. And Marilyn says, thanks, thanks, thanks be to God. Here's a prayer litany. Sometimes churches will call and say, I need a litany for a special disability awareness Sunday. What can I use? And it's next week. My recommendation is that if you really want people with intellectual disabilities or even people who have English as a second language to participate in litanies, you need to make them available to them 
before the worship service. So in your friendship program, you could do a prayer litany like this over the course of a several months. By the time it's used in worship, they will know how to participate. Here's the example. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And you would teach the friends to say, we thank you, Lord. Give thanks to God who made us. We thank you, Lord. Give thanks to God who brought us here together. We thank you, Lord. Let all God's children together say amen. And the friends could say amen. And now let all of God's children greet each other with joy. With this kind of participation, you'll find that the friends are better able to participate in church and you will also see fewer behaviors that are objectionable to other people. Another thing to keep in mind is choose familiar and shorter songs. Some of the shorter songs also can benefit from teaching uh, religious signing. An example is God is so good. Lord, listen to your children praying. These are very, very repetitive songs. The song, Lord, I lift your name on high, has many good motions to it. He is Lord, open my eyes, Lord. You can point to the eyes. May the Lord bless you is a beautiful song. And in my program, we taught the sign for bless, which is to put your hands forward like this. We've ended the worship service blessing the congregation. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you and take good care of you. What a beautiful blessing to end a worship service and allow your friends to do it. But the whole congregation could do it with you. Another thing to do is use simple dramas. Simple dramas are ones that allow the person to participate as we talked before. And one of the fun stories is Paul and Silas. Yes, Paul and Silas were shipwrecked and life was rough. But when we acted it out in friendship, we learned that maybe you need a sense of humor in a shipwreck. Our friend, Little Paul, was taking on the role of Paul the Apostle. In this story, we all sat on chairs and we rocked back and forth as if we were in a terrible storm. And then Jolyn, who was leading the story, gave out chunks of a baguette and everybody got a piece of the bread. But Paul was upset. He did not have what the bread needed and that was peanut butter. So for about five minutes, he stood there frustrated and angry. I need peanut butter. And we're all going, great, we don't have any peanut butter at church. Finally, we convinced him that before we swam to shore and before we dumped everything out of the boat, that it was okay to eat the bread. But it's a story that I never forgot because it was so unique in how little Paul interpreted the role of Paul the Apostle. And sometimes you have to laugh and sometimes you'll cry in these dramas because you are so touched by the, how the friends interpret the Bible story. Another tip to help you with people who have difficulty speaking is to use a kinesthetic prayer. This would be a prayer that has actions to it. In our curriculum, Learning the Lord's Prayer, we give a, almost like a drama dance to the Lord's Prayer. You can sing or say the Lord's Prayer and do the motions for it. This is a great way to teach the friends the concepts of the prayer, but also you can present it to your congregation after you have learned it. Here's a simple prayer for the Holy Spirit's illumination. If you need to move a friend's hands in order to have them participate, be very gentle and help them to move through it. Here it is. Lord, be in my mind and in my mouth and in my heart. Be on my left hand and my right hand. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. It is our hope that these simple tips will help you better minister beside adults with intellectual disabilities, ensuring they are given the opportunity to be full members of the body of Christ. A couple years ago, six of my friends were given the opportunity to be full members of our congregation. Most of them were wards of the state. They did not have family that had ever taken them to church, who had ever offered them for baptism. They had never been to Sunday school. This was an amazing Sunday for our congregation to witness all God's people being part of the body of Christ. It is my hope that as you think about ministering beside people with adults with intellectual disabilities, that you will see 
that all of God's family needs to be included, that they are very important to both God and his people.